Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. Up front today, more comments from attorney Thomas Todd with reactions from Rupert Richardson, president of the Louisiana NAACP, and A.Z. Young, executive assistant to the governor on minority affairs. In our one-to-one -one segment, Genevieve Stewart talks to Dr. Stella Jones, an obstetrician gynecologist who practices in New Orleans. We close today's show by telling you about a Canadian pilgrimage from Buxton, Canada to Louisiana. Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Hinton, and we'll have those stories today on Folks. Everybody says folks, just plain old folks. Everybody just people all over the world. All the folks who live, folks got to give, folks got to care, folks got to share. Our world is small. Hello everyone and welcome to Folks. Up front today, more explosive talk from civil rights activist Thomas Todd of Chicago. TNT is what we call this story, TNT being dynamite, and dynamite is one word used to describe Thomas N. Todd's address to a group of black lawyers in New Orleans. In today's first excerpt, Todd says blacks need to wake up, and he stressed the need for a new militancy. And so I say to you, wake up, black America. For we must return to a new militancy. Yes, not a new realism, a new militancy. You see, something happened to us. We moved from the streets to the sweeps. We no longer confronted because we thought we had become a member of the family. In corporate boardrooms and in conference rooms throughout the nation, we were sitting at the table, refusing to confront because we thought we had arrived. We must return to a new militancy and return to confrontations, and we must stand up and rise up and say that wherever injustice is, in the courtrooms or the bar rooms or the bathrooms or wherever they are, that we will confront it that we must confront it, that we must confront it. It is our only hope. Together we will and together we must. Well, what do you two think? Is there a need for a new militancy in the black community? AZ, what about you? What do you think? You know, I've gone through a stage uh, where that was absolutely need, uh, militancy that was really needed. And I feel that we have come a long ways in this country. And I don't feel that we need the kind of militancy that will take one's lives or create harm or danger to another individual in this late date. I think the progress that we have made, we need to build on that progress. That those of us who believe in, firstly, a God Almighty, should sit around the table of brotherhood and sit down and talk to our counterparts, the opposition as well, and try to bring these issues to the forefront and sit down and talk about the problems of the day and see if we can make a better tomorrow. I do not see the need of uh, persons um, coming out and trying to destroy one another in this late day. What about you, Rupert? Oh, I think AZ and I think too much alike on too many issues anyway. Perhaps you should have had more diversified personalities here. But he's absolutely right. Militancy, number one, is not a four-letter word. People think militancy and they think burning and looting and all of those kinds of things. The kind of militancy I think the speaker was talking about was a vigilance in your career with the young lawyers, a vigilance in trying to fight for equality. That we need. I don't think the day will ever come again for the kind of things that Mr. Young and I have seen. It served a purpose, mind you, at that time. 
It opened America's eyes. It really probed its conscience. I do not foresee ever that we should have to have that kind of America again. Do you think by using the word militancy, he might be alienating a lot of people? The ones that are alienated by it perhaps were not with us anyway, because he very much elaborated on the kind of militancy he was talking about. In the ballroom, in the bathroom, the whatever, he made it clear he's talking about fight your battles. And he didn't make any reference to rolling up your sleeves or taking guns. People are offended by that word. Many whites and many blacks are offended by it. But it's because they are looking at everything from a very narrow perspective. Okay, in this next clip, he talks about party politics and that blacks are often taken for granted by the Democratic Party and that here in Louisiana, we should be running our own candidates for statewide office. Tom Todd resents having to choose between the lesser of two white evils. I resent it. I resent Mr. Mondale and Mrs. Ferraro. I resent both of them because they have dared to take us for granted. This is my interpretation. Don't give this to Jesse. In meeting with Mondale's people, they said, you must vote for us because you can't vote for Ronald Reagan. I resent that. I resent that. So that you must go with us because for 30 years we've been good on civil rights. I resent that. I resent being told that I don't have the options. And I resent anybody telling me that, whether they are black or white or brown, or whether they are permanent or instant Negroes, whether they are Negroes permanently, or whether you just add hot water and they pop up. I resent it. I resent it. I resent it. And that's what you've got to understand. This is the threshold. This is the threshold of a new day and a new black man, new black woman. Do not misread the mood in black America. When Treen ran against Edwards, you had two powerful white politicians vying for the votes. But instead of black people running a black governor, gubernatorial candidate, they lined up on one white side or the other white side. I came down here and spoke at Gramlin and Southern, and I said, I see Negroes for Treen, Negroes for Edwards, but where in the hell are the Negroes for the Negroes? <laughs> Lining up on each side while white people fight out for power. What's wrong with us? Well, it's the impact of slavery on our psyche. Well, I'm gonna talk about you. You see, in slavery, black slaves could not have an ego. They lived their ego through the white slave master. So slaves were known to kill each other over which slave master was more generous and which slave master was richest and which slave master was kindest. My slave master, black folks did it in Louisiana, say my Massa Treen is better than your Massa Edwards. Okay, are blacks taken for granted by the Democratic <laughs> Party, do you think? Um, blacks may be taken for granted by the Democratic Party, but still and all at the same time, we have to look at not only the state of Louisiana, and let's go to Chicago, Illinois, where Todd is from. Is, that, if the, is there a different situation in Chicago than we have here in the state of Louisiana? Now, I'm a realist, and I believe that what is good for Louisiana ought to be good for Chicago. Now, you can't tell me about what we did, black folks did in Louisiana with our Evan Evans and a Dre Treen if you're not doing no better in Chicago. Now, I have to uh, agree that we are mostly affiliated with the Democratic Party. And we have been affiliated with the Democratic Party since the very existence. And we hang to the Democratic Party because of a record that we perceive to be a better record than that of the Republican Party. It's not that it's mandatory that we be in the Democratic or the Republican Party. I think we as leaders and, and, and as black individuals choose the Democratic Party for our own personal benefits. It's not because uh, we feel that somebody is taking us for granted that we have to be with Mondale or we have to be with uh, uh, Jerry Dean. We have a choice in the matter. We have demonstrated that we can stand up when time comes to stand up, particularly in this state. And I personally, uh, just in conclusion, feel that we here in Louisiana are on top of it. Over 90% of the people, of the blacks who voted in this last election voted Democratic. Mondale lost, Mondale lost big. 
What impact do you think that's going to have on the future of blacks voting in future elections? It's hard to predict. Political analysts play those kinds of games. But I feel that if nothing else, it showed some solidarity. It made a statement that 90% of the black people in America felt that the candidate that could best benefit us, the reality kind of thing, was Walter Mondale. If that was an error, we can't be punished much more by Mr. Reagan than we were the last four years. So we're just going to tighten our belt buckles and try to survive. And that's not a matter of getting off into partisan politics. It would not have mattered which label Mr. Mondale wore and which label Mr. Reagan wore. It was very clear that the philosophies of the two better aligned themselves to what the majority of black people wanted. I am still amazed at the 10% of black people that voted for Mr. Reagan. I cannot be convinced that that is as it should be. We have a saying in the association, it's not the man, it's the plan. The plan that Mr. Mondale and Ms. Ferrara had best fit my needs as a black American and evidently those of another 90%. Do you agree that Todd has a valid point when he says that blacks should be putting up their own candidates to run for statewide offices? I very much believe in blacks running their own candidates and certainly hope that we will see more of it in the future. There is a but, and it goes back to that word that AC used, reality. White people don't vote for black people and we are a minority in this state. Now perhaps if we continue to field candidates that are acceptable to us and we continue to vote in blocks, perhaps someone will, enough majority of people will say, well, you know, maybe we can support. But for right now, we vote for white people, but white people don't vote for black. And the reality of us electing a black to a statewide office the prognosis is just not good, but yes, we must continue to try. They certainly can't elect me if I don't run, so we do have to continue. We have to put our force behind them, and there's another thing that we can do. Use that block of votes sometimes to push people into a runoff, and then look at what he calls the lesser of the evils among white people and throw our weight that way. So yes, we have to field our candidates, but realistically, it may not happen within the next few years that we'll win. How do you feel, AZ? Well, you know, uh, a statewide race is, is a really hard race. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Jeffers is a good example. A very talented, uh, bright young man who ran for Secretary of State in 1979. Uh, one of his biggest problems was money problems. Uh, he did a beautiful job in trying to put together this state, particularly in the black community. He seeked out uh, many whites yes, to, for did. support. He, he gets, received some newspaper endorsement uh, particularly in Shreveport area, he got newspaper endorsement. And I thought that was a means of progress. So you have to start somewhere. Uh, ben started and he did real well. And I think that uh, somewhere on the horizon, there is a young black out there somewhere, male or female, that one day will be elected to a statewide elected uh, position in the state of Louisiana. You know, at one time we didn't have any black elected official, officials even locally, but because of our consistency, we held in there, and so finally we began to elect some blacks, and right now we rank in the top as far as other states, as compared to other states in the union in terms of black elected officials. Okay, we hear so much today about America's upbeat mood. Well, <laughs> in this last clip, Todd tells us how he sees America. As I look at America, I sometimes become very sad, for it was in America that I was born. I took my first steps in America. I met my mother and father in America. I shared my first tears in America. And by all human emotions and feelings, I should love America. But I ask you today, how can I love a nation that hates me so much? How can I do it? Oh, I want you to hear my personal lament. I fought your wars. I went to Korea. I went to World War II. I fought all of the wars. And I came home, and you kept me in bondage and kept me in segregation. America, what manner of nation are you? You wouldn't let me go to white schools. You sent me to black schools that were segregated and 
that were deliberately deprived. And then when I got an education, you told me I had a second class education. America, what manner of nation are you? I became lawyer and I became doctor. I became physicist. I became psychologist. I became nurse. I became all of that. But you still call me nigger. America, what manner of nation are you? OK. There are a lot of blacks who feel that way. Do you feel that we are really that disliked by white America? And if so, why should we love America? First place, uh, I too joined with Todd in saying this is my birthplace. Uh, also, I fought that was. And I have shed many tears. I have walked highways and byways singing, We Shall Overcome, trying to demonstrate and protest my feeling for this great nation. And I have met with many difficulties. But in spite of the difficulty that I have encountered, my peoples have encountered as an individual. I still wonder sometime how could this country be so determined to hold back a race that loves it so dearly. I ask too that same question. What is wrong, America, when we, the black peoples of this country, probably stand with you and beside you when all has failed, we are there? I have to agree with a great deal of his speech there. Rupert, your thoughts? Along the same line, it's easy for me to say why I love America, though. She, not only is she home, she's the only home I know. And with my limited experiences in other countries, I think she's the only home I would ever like to know. And that's true, I think, of most of our people. It's all we have, and yet it is so little to us. Yeah, hate is not too strong a word for how the majority race feels about black people. That's not to say 100% of whites hate or that 100% of blacks love. But the percentage is really too high. It's out of proportion. It's frightening. Evidently, America has no conscience. Because if she had a conscience, she could not continue to reject her most loyal group of citizens. It is frightening. It is depressing. It is hurting. It is everything that is degrading, except that black Americans are so strong, their self-concepts are so strong, and their love for America is so strong that we still believe that dream we shall overcome. We go now to our one-to-one -one segment, which today features Dr. Stella Jones of New Orleans, who is living proof that the traditionally male-dominated role in health care is changing. Genevieve? That's certainly true, Rob. When Hippocrates wrote the Hippocratic Oath for Physicians, he assumed that doctors forever and always would be men. Well, the number of black female physicians has dramatically increased to 3,500 and growing. Dr. Stella Jones is an exceptional example of the new woman in medicine. Dr. Stella Jones is an obstetrician gynecologist in her fourth year of private practice in New Orleans. Dr. Jones came from Houston for her specialty training at Charity Hospital. She became enamored with Louisiana culture and never left. Dr. Jones explained that racist and sexist obstacles she encountered actually led to her career in medicine. Black women being in medical school at the time that I finished pharmacy school was not popular. I don't even know that I could have gotten in at that time. So um, I uh, went to pharmacy school. And basically, because of one of the Martin Luther King movements in Atlanta, I was recruited as the first black pharmacist at uh, Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. I stayed there until it was time to, say, select a, a senior pharmacist. And as it turned out, uh, the reason that I was not put up for the job is because I was not old enough, but I think it was I was too black. So I became very disgruntled, and I left, and I came back to Houston. Um, I worked at the hospital as a staff pharmacist f until I had my second child. And at that time, I just, you know, felt a basic unrest. So I went back to school at University of Texas, and I got a master's in public health. And I was going to start working on a doctorate in public health, and I said, well, this is going to take me three years. Why should I do this? So I applied to medical school, and 
I thought that I had everything against me, but as it turned out, I had everything working for me. Dr. Jones, which among your personality traits makes you a good doctor? Well, I think especially with being in obstetrics and gynecology and dealing with the patient population that I have, I would say that about right now, 50% of my patient population is what we would consider, quote, unquote, the private patient. And about 50% of the patients are, are EDS or Medicaid recipients. They get no more or no less than the private patient. As a matter of fact, sometimes I find myself giving them more. And I have had people, I've had my colleagues ask me, why do you give them so much? And I tell my patients, I give you more because I expect more of you. And that's what you get back. When you give them so much, you get more back in return. You teach them, and you can see your teaching. You know, it all comes out. Raised in a family of meager means, Dr. Jones is one of seven children who are all executives or professionals. She attributes her success to encouraging parents and her supportive family and friends. In order to be successful, it's, it's not you alone. You have to surround yourself with, surround yourself with good people. I have a dynamic husband, a husband who gives me all the kinds of support that I need. We have to first of all start with him. Uh, my children are understanding. They're very understanding. You know, because in order for me to be a successful physician, I have to give up something sometimes, somewhere. And you can't imagine how many times they have to say, Mom, are you coming to the program today? And I have to say, I'm sorry, I have to go to a delivery, or I'm sorry, I had surgery already planned, but eventually we make it up. I have a wonderful housekeeper, and I have a dynamic office staff. And it takes all of those things working together to ultimately make you successful. It's a sort of interdependency. In spite of the tremendous demands on her time, Dr. Jones is a member of Jack and Jill of America, which promotes parenting skills and cultural programs for children. She is a member of the civically involved Suburban Arts Guild, and she serves on the board of directors of the Children's Bureau. Occasionally, she finds time for painting, interior decorating, and the piano. We close today's show by telling you about a pilgrimage some black Canadians made to Louisiana in an effort to discover their roots. They came to Louisiana from North Buxton, Canada by bus, all ancestors of 15 slaves taken to Canada by the Reverend William King. After inheriting them, he didn't want them to, well, he couldn't really free them in the state of Louisiana because they may be uh, seized and sold back into slavery. Uh, detesting slavery the way he did, uh, he felt his only hope and their only survivor really uh, hinged upon him taking them out of here and um, going on to Canada purchasing land where he did buy 4,500 acres of ground. Uh, of course, that large area um, was more, I guess, than what you'd consider 15 people needing, but he was wise enough to realize that uh, being so close to the border of this country that it was going to become a haven for fugitive slaves, and that it did. Mrs. Smith, who organized the Canadian's trip, first became interested in the connection between Louisiana and Buxton, Canada, while reading this book. This book uh, really has only about a paragraph talking about a plantation owner from Louisiana who uh, inherited 15 slaves. But of course, not liking slavery, he decided to take them to Canada. And um, this is where that story begins. And with me, it was this book. The first stop on the pilgrimage was a tour of the courthouse in Clinton, the same courthouse where Reverend King transacted a lot of his business. I wanted them to retrace Reverend King's route. I wanted them to see buildings uh, that he uh, had seen or to, to visit places that uh, their ancestors um, were familiar with. And uh, that's why I took them to the courthouse first, because Reverend King did 
uh, transact his business in that very building. And of course, that's where um, we uh, found the will that I had already, you know, pulled together, knew where it was. And of course, the uh, clerk of court uh, was expecting us, so she had it ready. And they were eager to get copies of that will because it did list those slaves by name that Reverend, um, I mean, I'm sorry, that uh, Mr. Farris uh, willed to his daughter. And uh, of course, they were able to get those wills. After the stop in Clinton, the Canadians ventured on to a church in Jackson, Louisiana. It was there that we got a chance to talk to some of them. The, the pilgrimage has, has been very fulfilling in that for most of us, it's a first. And, and uh, we really didn't know what to expect. But uh, regardless of what we expected, this has far exceeded our expectations, I'll assure you. And uh, the, 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 as I say, it, it being a first, we were kind of feeling our way, but as it advances, everybody, because of the, the general nature of the people with whom we've been in contact, it's just like old home week, you know? <laughs> yeah, and uh, every, everyone is, is, has really been put at ease, and there's no strained relationships, and, and uh, we're really looking forward to the balance of the pilgrimage. When we started out, you, you don't know just who you're gonna meet or all, you know? You feel that you're gonna wind up meeting a whole lot of fine people, and certainly we have, and they've gone all out here to uh, make us happy. I was talking to one gentleman in there, he mentioned about being in Victoria, and I'm sure he didn't realize how many miles he was from where we're from. And we're from uh, more of the central part, we're in Ontario. He was talking about being in British Columbia area, which is about 3,000 miles, I think it is, from uh, the area that we live in. But we've enjoy we are enjoying ourselves, and certainly we know as we get down into New Orleans, that it's even going to be greater. You know. My grandfather knew B. King from this area, but uh, he didn't, any of his sisters and others didn't come along with him, so therefore we've never had any contact with anyone. The night before the pilgrimage, officials at Southern University staged a concert to honor the Canadians, a concert featuring spirituals, jazz, and black Creole songs. <laughs> That's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. Be sure to catch us after Winterfest on December 16th. We'll see you then. Bye bye. Everybody's just folks, just plain old folks. Everybody's just folks, just plain old folks. Everybody's just folks. Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB.